Join us and Neighborhood Cats for all you need to know about Trap New to Return, TNR, and Colony Management. You'll learn the basics and walk away with the tools you need to be successful in helping outdoor cats. Workshops are typically held the first Saturday of the month. Registrants will have the opportunity to earn a certificate. For more information and to register today, go to communitycatspodcast.com. You've tuned in to the Community Cats Podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats Podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I've been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. And today we're speaking with Corinne Burgoyne. Corinne has been volunteering and working professionally at animal shelters in Massachusetts and Hawaii for over 15 years. She's held positions in animal care, client services, volunteer coordinating, managing community cat and TNR programs, and a high volume spay and neuter clinic. Currently the operations coordinator at the MSPCA Boston Adoption Center, Corinne is passionate about increasing return to home outcomes for stay cats. The improvements she's made to the MSPCA's lost and found pet program has resulted in a feline reclaim rate that is eight times the national average. When she's not tracking down microchip information or scrolling lost and found pet sites, she shares her life with her husband, the world's best dog, three quirky kitties, and an ever-revolving door of foster cats and kittens. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. <laughs> we get to talk for about a half an hour full of return to home. It's everything. I could fill it up. <laughs> so first and foremost, tell me a little bit about how you got to be passionate about cats. You know, I grew up in a household where we always had cats. They were always adopted from shelters. They were always spayed and neutered, even back in way when I was a kid back in the olden days. And I loved my cats, but I do think it was a big difference sort of becoming my own adult with my own cats. And the first two cats that I had sort of accidentally on purpose, both ended up being quite complicated um, medical special needs cats. And that just sort of led me down a, a path of like, well, other cats need help too. And so I started volunteering at the MSPCA and from there just led me to working in shelters and being really passionate about all things cat, but especially getting lost cats back to their families. A lot of times people will have like an aha moment. Some case will happen. Like, did a cat come in and you're like, I know this cat has a home. I know it has a home and I'm going to try and find a home. Is that like an aha moment? Did you have one of those moments? And then it helped you sort of cross the bridge to become this like lost and found detective? So I think it started... Actually, you know, when it started was when I was working at the Maui Humane Society. And when I first started working there, I was working in kind of what we call our client services. So all of the front facing, you know, folks who walk in, phone calls. And on my very first day, I got to call someone and tell them that their lost cat had come in. And that was just like, what feeling is better than that? It was like the best feeling ever, you know, of all the difficult conversations and phone calls and and face-to-face -face conversations we have to make in animal welfare to call someone and say, hey, your, your pet that's been missing is here and have them screaming and jumping up and down on, you know, on the phone. That was really exciting. So that definitely started it for me. And then um, at the MSPCA, managing the lost and found reports and the stray cats that come in just sort of became part of one of the many things I do in my job description. And I just, I just looked at, you know, what we had and thought, I feel like we could really nail this down. And, 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 um, you know, we're, we're so busy doing so many things that sometimes the idea that we think that maybe this cat doesn't have a home. And so that ends up low on the priority list of all the things that we need to do in sheltering. And I really felt like, no, that actually has to be one of our high priorities to make sure that we're doing our due diligence to see if this cat has an owner or not and try to get them back home. So before we dive into the whole process of, of what you do at the MSPCA, you know, what are your statistics like for cats? Yeah. So the Boston Adoption Center, we, our intake, our total intake for cats is around 800, 900 cats a year. And about a third of that is stray intake. So we're taking in, you know, three, 400 stray cats a year. So I basically look at it as like a stray a day is kind of what we're, what we're dealing with. 
And I do think because our Boston Adoption Center at the MSPCA is attached to the Angel Animal Medical Center, which is open 24 hours a day, is world renowned, you know, for having excellent medical care. We do see a pretty high incident of like sick and injured cats as well. You know, so if someone finds a cat that's been hit by a car, a cat that seems really unwell at 1 a.m. on a Saturday, there's not a whole lot of other places that are open to even bring the cat. So we do see kind of, you know, a, a big incidence of, of cats coming maybe from further away than you would think because of our um, attachment to the hospital. So about three or 400 stray cats a year. The most recent data, which is from Shelter Animals Count um, from 2020, said that the national average for uh, return to home for cats was 5% from their reporting shelters. And our stats for 2020 was 40% for return to home to cats, which is really exciting. The year before it was 36. Um, the year before it was 29, I think. I think it was basically in 2018, I started to think, is anyone tracking this? Is anyone looking at this? And I love statistics. So when I when at that time, I think it was maybe 22 or 23%. And I found out that about the national average was around 3%. Then we made it to 29. Then we made it to 36. And I remember for 2020, I was like, do we, can we hit 40? Like, could we do that? Could we hit 40? And when I crunched all the numbers, I was, I was just absolutely beside myself. That's fantastic. I want to ask you a clarifying question around that strays question. So do, does like a litter of six week old feral kittens, does that fall into the stray statistics or is that in a different category? It falls into the stray statistics. I have kind of two stats. So when we look at that 40% is not including cats under six months because generally that's what we're talking about, the litter of feral kittens. So um, I think in 2020, if we included those cats, it's like 35% or 36% or something. Um, but I think, you know, we track a lot of our stats that way for all kinds of things, kittens under six months or adult cats. And yeah, most of those, when we're getting in kittens, they're, they're usually not friendly, socialized owned kittens. They're, you know, feral kittens born outside. But that, yeah, that's a great question. And just to position things for folks that are in other parts of the country and actually around the world, this podcast is heard by folks all around the world. Uh, just tell me a little bit about the MSPCA. What's sort of the state of the situation with cat population in Massachusetts as you see it right now? Sure. Yeah. So with the MSPCA, um, so the MSPCA, we're the Massachusetts Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. We're the second oldest humane organization in the country. So we've been around for over 150 years and we have three adoption and pet resource centers. So the one that I work at, which is in the Jamaica Plain neighborhood of Boston, we have one on Cape Cod in the southern part of the state. And we also have one um, in Methuen in the northeastern part of the state, which also has a farm and equine animal program. And so I think you know, in Massachusetts and New England with organizations like the MSPCA, like Animal Rescue League, who's also been around a really long time, like MRFRS, like other, um, you know, spay neuter. I think, I think we're, we've been doing the spay neuter thing for a long time. Um, and we've been working hard to offer low and no cost and accessible spay neuter for a long time, which has really resulted in a pretty low population of, you know, cats that need to be surrendered to shelters, of cats that are homeless. So, I mean, I can remember even when I started volunteering at the MSPCA in 2007, you know, every cage had a cat in it. Every colony room was maxed out on its capacity for care for cats. And now these days we're able to give one spicy cat that whole colony room we're able to, um, you know, MSPCA has started working um, on transport for cats from other areas of the country that are in a more desperate situation or for natural disaster type things. So we have space um, and we have the opportunity to provide, you know, more in-depth behavior care and medical care for cats that come into our care and to make sure that we're doing our due diligence for the strays that come in the door as well. All right. Now we're going to have you put your pet detective hat on Okay. or your cat detective hat <laughs> on. So I, I, I get the sense that you had a discovery process, like what worked, what didn't work, what helped to be able to find an owner for, um, for a cat that was potentially brought in or somebody's called about a cat in their backyard. So just tell me a little bit about 
you know, what are the, the key components that you do in order to ensure that this is truly a stray cat? Yeah. So I think, are we kind of talking about first and foremost, if someone contacts us before they bring the cat in, I you can do both scenarios. So we sure. can start with the phone call and then we could start, then go to the, like, I'm showing up at your door. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that, you know, one scenario is that someone sees a cat, finds a cat, you know, the person who's reaching out to us obviously cares about animals and so wants to see um, this cat get the care that they need. So they might call us, um, they might um, shoot us an email, they might um, go to our website and fill out a found cat report. And in all those cases, I'm I'm sort of um, digging through the information that they're giving me to try to decide what the best advice for them would be. So of course, if they're getting in touch and they're saying this cat is injured, this cat seems very unwell, um, the cat is very, very thin. I will say everyone thinks the cat is thin because we're all used to our cats being overweight. And so often, you know, we hear that the cat is very thin and then we see it or it comes in and we go, this is actually a very cat in a great body condition, very healthy. But of course, if the, if the cat seems like it's unsafe or unwell, bring it in. That's what we're there for. When people contact me and say, this cat came up to me on the sidewalk and it's rolling around and it's rubbing on my legs and it, it came to my back porch and I put some food out and now it won't leave. Well, because you just made a friend and you put some food out. So they're for sure going to hang around for a little bit. So the way I always put it to people is, you know, the MSPCA is here for cats that need us. And if a cat needs us, bring it right in. What we're trying to balance is getting care for the cats that need us and not accidentally swiping people's indoor outdoor cats off the street where they live. So what I usually tell people is that, you know, a truly lost cat is probably not out and about greeting you on the sidewalk and flopping at your feet. That to me sounds like a confident indoor outdoor cat who knows its neighborhood and is just roaming around looking for pets and looking for treats. And so some things that you could do is you know, if it's safe to do so, take some paper and tape and put a collar on the cat, write on it, you know, are you my cat with your phone number? And then send them on their merry way. And you very likely will get a call later that night from your neighbor you never met before to say, hey, this is my cat. You know, I do tell people that if you put out food and you keep putting out food, the cat will keep coming around. So you kind of need to decide do you want to do that or not? Um, we've met a lot of uh, cat scammers in the neighborhood who are double dipping and getting fed at multiple households. Um, but the paper collar and then also just like talking to your neighbors, asking around, you know, they might know that Jojo lives in the yellow house down the street, putting up flyers in the neighborhood, posting on your local next door, on your local Facebook page. And very often you're getting that information or, that that cat belongs to someone. And then you've made a connection and you know who the cat is and now you know a new neighbor. So that's that's one scenario of, you know, is the cat in the neighborhood and, and what should I do? We also would offer to, if you want to scoop the cat up and if it's safe to do so and bring it in, we'd be happy to scan it for a microchip. So, you know, so if that cat is lost, that we can help facilitate that return. We'll also take a found report. So give us the information, send us a photo of the cat, We'll put that found report in our system, um, cross-reference it with lost reports to see if there's anyone might have reported that cat missing. We actually just yesterday um, on Tuesday, I had someone call us and say, uh, I found this black cat in Alston crying under a car and it only has half a tail. So it's pretty specific and easy to identify. And so I called them back and they were going to hang on to the cat and take it in to get it scanned for a chip and make some posts. And then the next day I got a lost report from someone saying, I lost a black cat in Alston who only has half a tail. And I said, I know who has your cat. And so we, in that instance, you know, where both parties reported to us, we were able to connect them directly without the cat ever having to come into the shelter, which was unnecessary in this case. Well, that's excellent. That's And uh, the community knows that you're the like hub yes. too. Yep. So yep. did, did you have to do anything specific, you know, with the community to say, you know, Hey, we're the place to, con- if you're missing a cat, we're the place to contact. Are you posting on the Facebook pages that are out there? Or, I mean, how are you getting the word out? Yeah. So the MSPCA, you know, we have our, our regular social media channel, which posts about all of our programs and adoptable animals and things like that. And then we have a specific dedicated Facebook page for 
when I say stray, I mean an animal that has then come into our shelter system, a found animal whose owner we don't, you know, we don't know if they have an owner that comes into our shelter system. So all of those animals get posted on a MSPCA stray pets page. And that page gets a lot of traction. It gets a lot of shares, a lot of comments then out into the other more local Facebook pages. So I think that in and of itself, people see that and see that we take in strays when necessary. And that also we're doing our due diligence to try to find the owners of the stray. We're not taking in the stray and then just sort of walking away and going through, you know, whatever the process would be. So I think that definitely instills some, some trust in us in the community. And then also, I think we've done a lot to improve the resources on our webpage. So if you go to mspca.org slash lost, um, you'll be, be able to see a list of advice, of resources. Um, the Front Street Animal Shelter in Sacramento made a couple of really great videos of what to do when you've lost a dog and lost a cat in both English and Spanish. And they're very generous with letting us share those. So those links are embedded on that page. And then there's also forms that you can fill out for lost or found pets of any kind. Um, so it really streamlines the process for folks. So I think those two things in and of themselves make us a place to go for reporting lost and found pets. So now let's switch the tables. Somebody just shows up with a cat. What happens then? Yeah. So if someone showed up with a cat, you know, first thing we would do is, of course, just get some basic information about them and where they found the cat. We have a form that we either ask them to fill out or we'll go over with them to fill out with them. I mean, it's, you know, it's kind of like a really basic personality profile for whatever they know about the cat. And sometimes there's very little that they know. They literally just found this cat and they're bringing it in. But sometimes it's a, I've been seeing this cat for a few days or a few weeks, or it lives in my neighborhood. Um, So information from that, that we're trying to get is, you know, very specifically where the cat was found have they been feeding the cat? Does anyone else in the neighborhood feed the cat? What's the cat's personality like out in the world? Because as we know, that could be, it could come in the shelter and present as something very different. It could be very scared or very shut down. But if we know from the finder that, oh, this cat, when it's, you know, in a, in its um, more comfortable environment, they're friendly, they're, they like, Yes. Like, have you ever seen them with kids? Have you ever seen them with interact with other pets, other dogs? Did you bring this cat in your house? How did it, do? Did it use the litter box? And that's also where we can open up a conversation to one, you know, sometimes when people bring these cats in, if no one, um, if we don't find an owner, they may be interested in adopting. So that's when we would kind of open up the conversation about what that process would look like. And would they like to have the first dibs, if you will, on the cat, if they aren't returned to home. And then also opening up a conversation about TNR. Um, and what that is and what that entails and why we might consider this cat a candidate for TNR. And if that's the case, talking to them about what that would look like for them and, and how that would work. And so we like to just get all that information up front. So then we're not in a holding pattern with the cat. You know, it used to be that we would be so busy and we'd say, okay, yep, uh huh, uh huh, here's the cat, great, here's your, take the cat, your information. And then a few days later, we'd be struggling with the cat's behavior or with what the pathway for the cat would be. And so we'd be calling the finder and playing phone tag. So that's one, that's a really big thing that we've realized is like, just get all the questions answered up front. So then you know what our options are so that we can keep moving forward with whatever the best pathway for the cat is. Yeah. And you mentioned working with TNR groups. How do they play a role in this? I mean, when you work with them, what sort of due diligence do you require of the cats that they bring in? Actually, when I was saying TNR, it would be like us talking to the finder directly to say like, if the behavior of this cat doesn't seem compatible with like a traditional adoption outcome or like even a working cat outcome that then we may consider as long as, you know, all the TNR things, it looks healthy. It seemed like it was doing well where it came from. Then we would TNR it and return it to your neighborhood. So, you know, would you be willing to be a caretaker? Would you feed it? You may see this cat back with an ear tip. Um, so that's, so we would do that directly. I mean, we certainly work with great TNR groups and, and our um, spay neuter clinics help provide some of the care that for the cats that they trap and bring in. Um, but this would more be directly sort of a conversation with the finder. Right. But in terms of at MSPCA, often or sometimes the TNR groups, there will be some cats that do come in Mm. and that they you're dependent on them for doing the sort of the community due diligence to ensure that. I mean, I know that there's quite a few communities that the MSPCA supports that, you know, have have really 
tough social vulnerability index numbers and that yeah. kind of thing. And there's a lot of, of transient population and, and that kind of stuff. And so these, the TNR groups and, and also providing very low cost spay and neuter for the owned cat population in those communities. But I would assume some of those TNR groups would end up bringing some cats in for adoption too. Yeah, we sometimes will get, um, so there's some groups that, you know, we have really just open communication with and they will um, pretty regularly, which I so appreciate, just shoot me a picture and an email and a description and say, hey, we trapped this cat. He's really friendly or we trapped this cat and he's already neutered. You know, do you have any matching loss reports? Or sometimes when they will trap and come into the clinic for spay neuter, if it turns out that the cat is very friendly, um, we might sometimes you know, come to an agreement with them that like, we'll then take the cat in as, as a stray and do all the things that we're talking about. So, you know, check lost yep. reports, things like that. So, yeah. So yeah, it's definitely a collaborative effort. And I think, um, I think it is a tricky place to be in TNR, which is like, you want to get these cats spayed and neutered and acknowledging that a lot of the places, like you said, that groups are going out to help with TNR are the same places where these cats might be owned and people love them. And they have, you know, maybe just a lack of access to resources. And how do we close the circle on that? Right. Right. And make sure we're not just, again, making presumptions about cats and just taking them from where they live because they might love where they live and they might have people who love them who don't know where to reach out to then once the cat is missing. And also they may not have the ability or know where to reach out to get resources necessary maybe to support the needs of the cat. So the cat may not look so great because it's got fleas. And if it's got fleas, nobody wants to live with a cat that's got fleas or is in heat or is spraying. So they love the cat, but the cat's got all this other stuff going on, but they don't have the ability, you know, to get the cat spayed or neutered or treated, or, you know, there's just, there's, there's so much in that family basket, Yeah, you know, that we want to make sure we fill those gaps and that having, taking that cat and putting that cat up for adoption used to be the only thing in the basket. And it needs to be a lot of other things right now to be able to serve the community. Team Dubert is at it again. And now they have an amazing companion case management module that once again, revolutionizes how you rescue animals. Dubert partnered with Dallas Pets Alive and the Spay Neuter Network to build a powerful solution that allows you to manage cases of any kind. Whether owner surrender calls or emails, community cat tracking and reporting, Dubert is the only system that integrates two-way text messaging, automatic follow-ups, and even a rehoming solution that every organization can use. No more trying to manage 10 different technologies when everything is all in one place and tightly integrated. From fostering to transport, fundraising to e-commerce, supply and demand to case management, Dubert has everything you need to streamline your operations so you can focus on saving more animals. Check out the new companion case management module at www.dubert.com CCM and get signed up today. Ever wanted to quickly connect, collaborate, or problem solve with others in the animal welfare field who are, you know, real people? Look no further than Maddie's Pet Forum. Maddie's Pet Forum brings people of animal welfare together with the common goal to keep more people and pets together. We share ideas, expertise, offer each other support, resources, and more. Visit forum.maddiespetforum.org slash cats. Maddie's Pet Forum. Come for an answer. Stay for the community. In terms of, you know, your tool basket and what you use, so you've talked about a listing that you have and you do a a match and you've talked about an internal Facebook page. Yeah, I know at least in Massachusetts, there are some, there's organizations like uh, Missing Dogs of Massachusetts. There's um, a lot of, there's like three towns, like Lost and Found for three towns Facebook page. And I'm sure there's more than the one that I know of, right? That goes all across Massachusetts. Do you have volunteers who like troll those networks to try and see about matching or, you know, what is the most efficient use of your time? If I was going to start a program to try and get to that 40% rate that you've got, what are the things we should do that would get us there the quickest? Yeah. So I would say the two things are one is the social media. Now, I wish I would tell you that I have a group of volunteers who are constantly trolling those pages. We have a handful of people who will reach out about things. It very often is it's more a community based thing. We put up a post, you know, of a lost cat that was brought in from Dedham 
on the MSPCA page that gets there, you know, there are groups of people who manage those individual towns, Facebook pages. And I think those are kind of the heroes of the situation here. Cause then someone who I don't even know who they are, they see that post on our page. They then share that to the dead of mass lots cats, Facebook page. And that gets in front of the right person, whether it's actually the owner or it's the neighbor or it's the granddaughter or something like that. So about a quarter of all of our reclaims are from social media. So cats that otherwise we've, we, you know, we it didn't have a microchip or the microchip was a dead end and we've checked our loss reports. Um, we also, just as an aside, we'll also like call the ACO from the town where the cats are found, call if there's another shelter close by, we'll contact them to sometimes, especially in Boston, we're so lucky to have Boston, you know, MSPCA, Boston Animal Control, who's wonderful and really responsive and Animal Rescue League. And so the three of us are in constant communication about all of our strays. And sometimes what happens is I get a cat in, but they didn't report, the owners didn't report it lost to me, but they reported it lost to Animal Rescue League. And so instead of it just being out in the ether and none of us communicate and as an owner, how would they know that there's three different places that you should probably contact? we're able to communicate that way. But yeah, the social media is a big one. And then really the, the other big one for us is detective work on out-of-date microchips. So if you get a microchip and it says either it's not registered or it's registered and you try that phone number and it's out of service, that is not a place to give up. That's not a place to stop. That's a place to start. That's where the fun starts, I think. So, you know, one, if it's if it's not registered at all, or even if it is registered, whenever I call the microchip company, I'm making sure to ask them what the implant facility is. So who who do they sell this microchip to and who put this microchip in this animal? And then hopefully, which often happens when you call that shelter or that vet, you know, maybe they they don't register it for the people, but they have internal records. So they can look up that chip in their internal system and be able to tell you who that client was, who that patient was. So that's one thing. And then if you do have um, if the chip is registered, but it's out of date, that's what Google was invented for. So I'm going to look up, you know, a name, I'm going to look up phone numbers and really a name, you know, I'm, I've gotten people's work email address, you know, by Googling them. Of course, if you have a very common name, if the chip is registered to John Sullivan, this may not be as effective. Um, but, you know, finding people's work addresses, finding people on Facebook, sending them a direct message, hearing back from them. And it's often, you know, people that just had no idea, maybe they didn't even know that their pet had a chip or that, you know, I think getting the message out about keeping your chips up to date is obviously super duper important. My favorite chip detective story of all time is that we had a chip. It was registered. The phone number was out of date. When I Googled the name, I found a obituary that corresponded with the person. So I presume that that person had uh, was deceased. But in the obituary, there was a next of kin listed as living in the same town where the cat was found. So I was like, well, that makes sense. So-and-so passed away. Their next of kin took the cat after the owner passed away. That all tracks for me. And then basically from there, it was then doing a little Googling on that person. And lo and behold, the cat was found a street away from that person's address. And so we weren't able to get them on the phone, but someone swung by and left a flyer on their door and you could tell they were missing a cat. They had a cat bed and their food out on the front porch waiting for her to come home. So when they came home, they called us. And that whole thing from like Googling the my, you know, the owner's information to going out and leaving a flyer on their porch took 45 minutes. Like, wow. and that to me is a hundred percent worth whether it's staff time or volunteer time. I mean, it's just thinking outside the box, right? Because also you could have we could have said, oh, the owner's deceased. Right. But yeah, got a little bit better than that. I love that one. It's my favorite. That's a great one. It's a great story. Right. And proves that there's more value to the microchip than what we think for sure. Definitely. Yeah. And then sometimes when we're finding, you know, owners, what the answer that we get is maybe they rehomed that cat, then we're able to get information about who they rehomed it to, you know, so then, then we've moved on from there too. So it's, that's about another, you know, working microchips are about a third of our reclaims. And then a quarter is social media and another quarter is um, uh, that math doesn't add up at all. Does it? Nope. It sure doesn't. <laughs> but yeah, a third is, is working microchips. And then uh, second is Facebook and then uh, detective work on, on microchips are about are pretty much exactly the same, the Facebook and the detective works on um, out of date microchips. 
you talked about sort of the individuals who are on those Facebook groups and, and setting stuff up. And I say, based on what I know from, from mass cats, you know, we, we have a pretty intense cat community. I mean, they, they troll Craigslist and they yeah. troll everything. So they, there's like no cat left behind in, in their world, at least here in, in Massachusetts. Do you get a sense that some of these suggestions or these things that you're doing at the MSPCA that, some of the organizations in Massachusetts, the other organizations are doing that too. I mean, you talk about how you, you talked with Boston animal control and animal rescue league of Boston and not to put them on the spot or anything like that, but you know, have you been able to share these tips and tricks with other organizations? Yeah. I think that, you know, again, specifically because we're a Boston shelter, we're working with Boston animal control and animal rescue league. And I think that they're both on board with with what we're doing. I I think it's I think a little bit. I think it takes the organization deciding that they want to allocate some staffing time to this. You know that it just it takes it takes a little bit of someone's time. And whether it's at the MSPCA like us, where it's um you know it's the majority of my job, and obviously our entire staff is involved, but I'm kind of the one looking at everything every day. Or I mean, it could be that could be organized organized in a bunch of different ways. It doesn't have to be that way, but I think it takes the organization believing in, in the program and that it could have good outcomes overall for everyone. Cause obviously then you're decreasing your length of stay overall. You're opening up spaces for the animals who really need to be there. But I mean, sure. I want to walk in every shelter and take them under my wing and say like, what's your challenge? How can we overcome this? How can we in- improve these rates? How can we increase these rates? And I think, the biggest thing, you know, I could tell you exactly what I do, what our steps are, but I think it takes an organizational mind shift. That's the most important thing to begin with. Is it to believe that there really truly is a home for that cat? Yeah, I think that, you know, and even if we sit here talking about how, you know, generally things are pretty good in animal welfare here in Massachusetts and New England, it doesn't mean that we still don't feel under-resourced and, um, you know, that we've got too much on our plate every single day. And so I think, I don't know that most people know that that national reclaim average was 3% or 5%, but I think they know anecdotally most stray cats that come into their shelters don't get reclaimed. So if they're doing that million mental checklist all day long, then putting a little extra effort into the stray cat in their mind probably They don't believe it's going to have a good outcome. So that falls to the bottom of the to-do list. And I guess what I would say is that if we put the effort in, then actually that could have a good outcome, which again, benefits all the animals overall with, you know, more open space. And I think, you know, you could say that the onus is on the owner to do things to find their pet, which is sure. That's absolutely true. I think that there are so many reasons why people have no idea what to do. Even, you know, the people that you and I might think are those gold star A plus adopters that you want to adopt every animal in your organization. When their pet goes missing, they have no idea what to do. They're stressed. They're panicked. Like we just said, in the city of Boston alone, there's three different, there's a minimum of three different places that you should call. And so yes, the owner is somewhat on the owner, but I think that if we are positioning ourselves as experts in animal welfare in the community, that actually it lies on us to do some of the legwork to find these people to get to get their pets back to them. You know, not even considering, you know, language barriers, resource barriers, like we were talking about before. And, you know, I mean, even to be honest, when we do find people, our hours aren't especially friendly for someone who's working, you know, a normal job or maybe two jobs to come and pick up their cat. And so there's lots of, you know, barriers to, to reclaim just simply from that standpoint um, that I think we could all be more considerate of. Corinne, if folks are interested in finding out more about the work that you're doing at the MSPCA, how would they do that? Yeah, I could chat about this all day. So you can email me at lostpet at mspca.org. That's just one lost pet. So L-O-S-T-P-E-T at mspca.org. If you call us at 617-522-5055, you can get routed to, we have a specific lost and found hotline. So if you wanted to call me, you can always leave me a message there. Again, it's 617-522-5055. But I would be thrilled to 
chat with anyone who's passionate about this and wants to look at what process they have in place and how they could maybe, you know, just little improvements. It's, you know, you don't have to get all the way there right away, but every little improvement. And it feels so great. I just think nothing feels better than helping a a pet get back to their, their family that loves them. Sounds great. Anything else you'd like to share with our listeners before we close today? I don't think so. Yeah. No, I mean, I just think these stories are just amazing. They're tremendous. I want to thank you for the work that you're doing. I was so excited about this interview today. I was like, woohoo, you know, (laughs) because it gets you excited. It gets me excited. It's the whole vision of turning your passion for cats into action. And that's what you've done. And I, you know, I certainly know now that we're entering into colder part of the year, people get more nervous about those cats being outside and, you know, just to continue to have to uh, think about how to help folks get those cats back home, you know, even when it's like snowing outside and all that stuff. Yeah, actually, I do have something. Can I say something? Go right ahead. Um, So I guess one thing, you know, we talk about people reporting found pets and things like that. You know, I think another thing that it's really important for us to talk about is that it isn't necessarily, it's not finders keepers when you find a pet. So, you know, if you find a cat and you think that this cat found you and that they want to be part of your family, it's still really important to report it to your local shelter and animal control to get the cat scan for a microchip um, because we really don't know if someone's missing that cat. Um, And it would, you know, if it were your own pet, you would want someone to do the same thing. So, you know, we see that every once in a while that we had a cat come in this week who had a microchip and he was found in Hyde Park neighborhood of Boston and he had been missing from Haverhill for three years. So he didn't get to Boston by himself. So we'll never know his story. Um, but you know that that your local shelter and animal control is also there to kind of facilitate that. Like if no one comes, if you do your due diligence and no one do your due diligence and no one comes forward, then great. Then you have a new cat. Um, but that we shouldn't just like in the shelter, we're not making presumptions that we want to get the word out to a community that we also that they should also be doing their due diligence as well. Excellent. Corinne, I want to thank you so much for being a guest on the show today, and I hope we'll have you on again in the future. I would love that. That's it for this week. Please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. We love to hear what you think, and a five-star review really helps others find the show. You can also join the conversation with listeners, cat caretakers, and me on Facebook and Instagram. And don't forget to hit follow or subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss a single show. Thanks for listening, and thank you for everything that you do to help create a safe and healthy world for cats. Bye.